in those spots, those places, for five more names, gives the name of somebody in your area close by, that the name, the address, if possible, the telephone, the type of production, and the amount of production by each of those names. And that you pledge that in the next two weeks, you will contact those five people. And this will give us the necessary quick impetus if it's carried out. So the slogan of this convention from now on and the thoughts should not be just farm power, but the way to achieve farm power is for each one to get five more. And you know the part about this thought and this plan. You know it's not going to be the end. We're going to keep that right down on your something that you might have. Whose names you put down because you're going to hand those in. And don't put them down unless you intend to do it. Because people will be calling you from the commodity departments to find out how you got along and what each one said. And not only that, if they didn't, you didn't get those five, they'll be asking you for more names to fill in. No more just holding up our hands. I can't make you do it. But I'll say one thing. Please don't do it if you don't intend to follow through. And don't put anybody's name on that list that has been contacted within the last year. Make them all new names and new people. Different people. You know, it doesn't do us any good to just go around talking to each other, does it? Right? We're not expanding our base. And pick the best producers in your communities. So that's on commodities. There's other jobs to do. We'll have a meeting announced before this convention is over. And that is that those that like to collect dues, that we would like to have them help. You know, we've spent too much money collecting dues. And out of this convention, we're going to ask that every county get up their back dues of those at least within the last two years. Immediately in the next two weeks. And just simply say you were in St. Louis, we're going for March 1st for cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts. And we've got to have your dues. And then add, we also have to have your production. And then there are those that owe several hundred dollars dues. Who several have said, and last year a lot of them did convert. And we had an attitude in our organization in some areas, but not many. I paid my dues all the years, so can that so-and-so. We have a policy to forgive the dues of all those that are over $225. That for $175 membership agreement, whether it be a one-year or a three-year agreement, that all the past dues are forgiven. If that isn't the best deal that could possibly be offered to show the intent of this organization, 
that they want to get the job done and it takes production and we want it, I don't know how it could be better. So we will want to talk to those that will work on dues conversion by areas. And that's not all. We need the support of the rural business people and we have the certificate of support. The only way they're going to survive is for the farmers to get a price. And they need to support us and we need to support but we need their support, whatever they feel they can give, in the legal limits and the confines of which we have to operate. And if you will do that, and we'll have the meetings, I want to do one thing this winter. With the help of a lot of others and to help the young farmers in this country. If there's one ability that I have, and sometimes I question, you know, it has been the ability to organize, but I have not been able to use that ability because of administrative necessities. In the dollar days, I went to the sale barns, had a meeting, picked six or eight people out of four or five hundred people. We talked over and we divided it up. It wasn't very complicated. When we started on the collective bargaining program, as somebody mentioned, we had $880 in the treasury. And we wanted to put on an organizational drive that winter and I made a plea in that convention at St. Joe, Missouri, that a hundred counties, I believe it was a hundred, but I remember the number, that they got a hundred members, we were just starting on the 25-hour year membership agreement, by Christmas, or not later than the first of the year. It was a little earlier in the year, fall. I know some of you were in that meeting undoubtedly. Hold up your hands over the audience. There you were. And we did it, didn't we? And we put together enough money to kick off an organizational drive that winter. I want to spend my time this winter not in large meetings, but in meeting when working with the young farmers to set up the most aggressive organizing structure young farmers ever had in this country, if you'll help do the other jobs and help me do those things too, we'll all work on it, but we'll set up a structure of young farmers, one over, over every two counties, that will help us tremendously, and they will coordinate among themselves, each five or six of them under a state coordinator, and we'll have a reporting system that we'll know what every one of them that has agreed to do something in every two counties has done by Thursday night of every week. And we'll meet with them every two weeks in the process of doing it. I think that we have an obligation an obligation a responsibility and a desire. The young farmers of this country could never put together in time a structure that could get them the cost of production plus a reasonable profit by March, or I would dare say in the next 10 years or 15. They might do it faster than we did it, but you look at the history of companies you look at the history of organizations, and 20 years is a pretty short time in the corporate structure to make a national corporate structure in this country. It usually takes a lot longer. We have an obligation for our own sons and daughters, our grandchildren, those we may be so proud of, or those that live next door, 
We have that obligation. And we're going to make the decision. And I can tell you that in getting with the people, there's a pretty simple way to talk to people. I've been on those hundred farms. And I start off in saying, do you believe farmers should organize? And if a guy says no, I say, sure, been nice meeting you. I'm not going to argue with somebody. Why? Because when they see everybody else organized in this economy, the companies, labor, everybody else, and they don't think farmers should organize, goodbye. I want to talk to somebody else. And when I ask them, do you believe farmers should organize, and they say yes, I say, what do you mean by that? Or I follow, depending if the, if the person wants to bristle a little, I don't raise my voice. And that's something we've got to do. You know, we can't be out there fighting everybody all the time. We got to be such great fighters that we whipped everybody that showed up and hunted people that we couldn't find to whip, you know. And that's fine. But we've got to be logical, business-like, and persuasive. But the persuasiveness, and you notice my tone of voice is a little different, and I'm fighting it a little too, to hold it down. Because I'm so determined that instead of giving an instructive, what I hope is an instructive speech, I'd like to say an awful lot of things of unfairness and injustices. But I'm trying, as I've been told by several of the people around me, try to explain how to do it. And all that I can tell you is working for me. I ask them, do you believe farmers should organize? And then if they say no, goodbye. If they say yes, ask them what they mean, or ask them, why do you say that? And then we go over the conclusions that we reach. I just ask questions. I'm not going to give a long discussion, sit down at a table with eight or ten people around it. I don't ask them a lot, or say a lot of things. And then I say, where do you think farmer's strength is? Somebody says in legislation, I say 3% of the votes, 100% of the food. Seems to me that we've got the strength in our production. But I won't argue with them. Let them see. That our strength is at the marketplace. And then we finally come to a conclusion pretty quickly that their production is their only strength. And that then we tell them if production is only strength, we need your help. None of that punching them, you know, you so and so, you. You should have woke up a long time ago, or if some new member comes in, don't do this, folks, as I've heard some people do. Makes me cringe. You finally woke up, did you? As a new member came in. Man, the way to convince and influence people. Glad you're here. We need your help. And so that's the way that we've got to change. And we've got to give them responsibility. And then we say, try it. What have they got to lose to try the programs that we're recommending? If I'm right and you're right, a total national collective bargaining structure that gets competitive prices while it's being built is the best bargain the farmers of this nation ever had.
And where does the battle go? I don't know where all it leads. Buyers will fight a little harder. Sure, as the production builds, in some cases, companies are making decisions and management changes because, you know, they have problems of management on a procurement structure. We have the opportunity to do it, folks. And I'll tell you, that I want next week off before Christmas as bad as anybody could want it. But I have pledged that if everybody else does, I'll make at least 10 meetings next week, maybe 12, with young farmers, three a day. We don't have the time to waste. Last year, I came into the convention having been under deposition for four or five days. Rundle Saturday night. Make any difference? This year, if it hadn't been for the storm until Friday night, I'd been meeting with young farmers in various areas. Setting up the structure. Because I want to see us build a team, two teams. Two teams of young farmers talking to the farmers their age and building that structure. The rest of us doing the other jobs and helping them when, when we're called upon. But I want to see two generations of farmers united for the good of agriculture in this nation to be able March 1st to say this is our price and you either pay it or you don't get our products. That's what I want to see. And where does all this lead us? Well, there will be a lot of people fighting. And I can tell you now that I have good information on two things. That unless the farmers unite, they're going to be made the goats of inflation. The biggest goats that ever walked. because all the emphasis being placed on the price of food, because the farmers are the weakest group in this country. They're not going to really tackle the business community in this country or organize labor. That'll be the jawboning, but the effect and the pressure will go on the unorganized farmers. And I can tell you the information that I have right now, if there's very much increase in the price of beef, they're ready to suspend the import restrictions that would reduce the amount of beef to be shipped in this country this year because of the formulas, to suspend that and to raise the imported beef in this country imported up to 1.5 billion to 1.6 billion. Almost two, 250 million pounds more than would come in under the quotas as now determined. And the dairymen that have been resting so comfortable, my information is that in Geneva they've reached an agreement that there will be about 70 million pounds of cheese imported into this country over and above what has been. They're not going to miss anybody. And I can tell you that we have the food. And I believe that the prices, as I've said here, the St. Louis, that they have to be increased 20% to the farmers on an average across the board to meet their expenses and their production costs. And that might be even a little low, and they wanted to know what about the presidents? Inflationary or inflation efforts 
anti-inflation efforts and staying within their guidelines. You know, we've been below those guideline, uh, guidelines so long and now when all the efforts against inflation are going to be directed against the farmers in this country. I don't know where the fight leads. And I believe in our government and I believe in our officials, regardless of political parties. But I am not afraid to fight for justice and equity in a showdown battle if it means confrontation with the government or anybody else in this country, if the farmers will stand behind. And I've been there in confrontation. I don't enjoy it, but I have never run, you know. But I'll tell you one thing, you can count on something else. Don't come at the last minute when crisis come and expect me to lead the fight if you're only going to give us a BB gun to fight the elephant because you're looking for the wrong guy. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. And I've been in many of the battles that I have never shied away from. And I have one goal that I think is our responsibility, that I am willing to give all the strength and energy and whatever ability I have to make it possible for the young farmers of this country to survive and to fight together. I think we as our generation owe them that. And coupled with that will be our pride of having overcome odds a million to one or 500,000 or a thousand to one. They didn't think we could do it, the pride of having done it will be something we can be proud of. Not to be ones that gloat in victory, but ones that can carry personal pride that we did what nobody thought we could do because it was right and it was just. And so when those papers are passed out, and for you to sign to contact those five people, it means we've got our eye on you, you know. I'm not fooling you. We'll be calling. Somebody will. And somebody will help you. And as these other jobs are performed, we'll help all we can. But you know the numbers that it takes now are so much smaller in numbers that it would have taken 10 years ago, Devon. Unbelievable. You give me 50 farmers in a county on an average, not me, but all of us together, it doesn't take the 250, 300, or 400 we used to have to have. You put those together as a knit group and the bargaining successes in advance that we can make, it's all over. We will have achieved our goals. I don't know what else to say. We're going to start in a few minutes because we've got to have everything going. We're that close. And you that have never heard me or have heard me over the years, no, I was always the conservative guy. I never made you any promises. I always said it could be done. I recognized six or seven years ago we had to be competitive in prices 
that there wouldn't be enough people that would follow a philosophical rainbow over to the pot of gold unless we were competitive in prices. And I went out to put together the people that could assist us doing that. That is practically completed. So I'm not telling you always before there was a conservative appraisal. We can. I'm telling you we're that close with the structure nationwide, the competitive prices that we've got. Sure, once in a while we may be under a little all I ask people to, for a short period of time of a few months, average it out and see how it'll be. Somebody may beat us occasionally, but the couples that live together, you know, just because they spotted once didn't mean they all broke up. It means that over the average, and I think almost without exception, and I'll not hedge on that, but that's all I ask. If our programs do not stand on their own feet, as competitive prices, then we do not deserve the support of the farmers in this country. But if they do, which I'm confident, with what I said where it isn't, just put a little more production together and concentrate on the programs that are working and accepted, and drive it from there and then build those from there that are not as working as good because of a little lack in volume, which means you might not have all the outlets you need. We're going to list here, planning tonight, and state caucuses, and I'm going to be around every one of them, because we're going to put the whole package together. I say we. I'll do my part. And some of us maybe haven't done as much as we could for a while. We've been resting a little. But you know, it's foolish to run 95 miles of a 100-mile race and not run that last five miles harder than we run the first five. The horse that wins isn't the first one out of the gate sometimes, you know. But the horse that wins is the one that finishes first at the finish line, right? I just want to leave you one thought. And somebody said this to me, and I think it's accurate because I had read it. How many of you ever heard of Babe Ruth? Sure, about everybody read about Babe Ruth. Maybe you've heard this. What do you remember? How many of you remember him for his home runs? Huh? A lot of you? How many of you know? that not only did he have the most home runs, he had the most strikeouts on record. But the principal thought in that is he was in there swinging and he came out on top, didn't he? There's going to be those state caucuses. I'll be around for a moment, in a moment for a few minutes in each one. There's nothing else that I can tell you. We'll have more explanation of how to do it in the various meetings. I want you to think seriously. What does it mean, not in pride alone, but what does it mean to the people in this country as farmers and people in rural America to be able to say, this is our price. It's cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The same that everybody else sells everything you buy to you and the same way labor operates just with a lunch bucket. Is it worth fighting for? Is it worth from now to the 1st of March using ever ingenuity that you can think of, every convincing way that you can think of, work as a team to build the programs and to make them work even better? It is to me. 
How about you? Thank you. I just want to say that the caucuses will be held, but the one thing it means to me, and that is, let's come back to next year's convention. We might even go somewhere like other people go, you know. And let's go out there and do it and come back to next year's convention with the pride and joy of having known we did it. Would you please remain seated? Would you please sit down while the information's read off? For about a year now, we've been talking to our people about the 30% concept, which is right. Last year, we happened to be in a staff meeting with some of the executive uh, people along with the professional people, and the question was asked uh, of those professional people, what would it really take? What would it really take to accomplish what we're talking to our people about? Could you do it with 5%? No. Could you do it with 15%, 20%? Would it take 30%? One of those professional people said in response, you give me 5% and I'll cause that market to surge upward and I'll keep it moving up. You give me 15% and I'll put it at cost of production. You give me 20% and I'll hold it there from this day forward. <laughs> Let me announce the rooms for the state caucuses. These states will go to room 270, 270. Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and Mississippi. They will go to room 270. That's on the second floor. Room 272 will go to Arizona. Room 272, Arizona, Texas, Utah, California, New Mexico, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Room 272. Room 273 will be New England, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Room 273. Room 274 will be Kansas, Colorado, and Wyoming. 274. Room 275 will be Montana and North Dakota. Room 275. Room 263. Those going there will be South Dakota and Nebraska. Room 263. Room 262 will be Michigan and Ohio. That will be room 262. Room 261 will be Iowa. Room 260 will be Illinois. Room 120 will be Minnesota. Room 123 will be Missouri. Room 132 will be Indiana. Room 276 will be Oklahoma. We'd like you to go to those rooms immediately. Microphone number eight, I'm sorry. Okay, Is this, can you hear? Yeah. Wisconsin, where are you going? Hey, we want to make a challenge from Missouri. <laughs> Biggest one yet. We're going, okay, we're going to challenge the whole United States that Missouri will put more feeder calves together next year than the whole rest of the states combined like we have in the past. 